historic here today. Uh, I just want to uh, bring us up to date here uh, to, as to where this course is going, this roundtable. It's not exactly a roundtable, but it, it'll serve its purpose. Um, we started off about five years ago with uh, Rabbi Kurtz, was uh, the, one of the few uh, modern Orthodox rabbis that loves literature. And so we started this course together five years ago, and we've come quite a way. Uh, he, uh, he, he dropped anchor, so to speak, uh, and left me in port. Uh, and I've been continuing for the last two years. This is about our 20th session. And uh, last year, just to make us up to date, uh, we covered Dylan Thomas, uh, Mike Hubert him here. Mike was here for that one and probably Gloria. Uh, Dylan Thomas, a great poet, wrote about uh, do not go gently into that good night. So yes. that's the theme uh, of this time of the year. I try to pick out poetry or prose that the has rage, to do with rage. the rage. Who rage, said, rage. Do not go gently into that good night. Old age should not, should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage, rage against the dying of the light. So that was last year. Uh, we did all time. Three years ago, we did The Man to Send Rain Clouds, written by an uh, a, um, indigenous American uh, writer, Leslie Marmon Sarko. And she spoke about the power of uh, Native American tradition to bring fruition to the land, to make make the crops grow, to, to have harmony in the universe, because land is the hero of that particular short story. Okay, um, bring us up to date. And basically what I summarized that that short story was followed by Deb Holland, who was appointed, she's the first Native American citizen in our country to be appointed to the uh, Department of Interior. She runs it, and she's a Native American from the, one of the um, Mid, uh, Western tribes, Mojave, I believe. Uh, so that coincided with that. So my theme that last la three years ago was the power of great literature, prose poetry to inform, transform, rectify human behavior and bring social change because that's what we're all after is uh, bringing some positive change into our world, which is so sadly uh, broken down in so many ways. So we're, we're here together as a group in order to bring uh, actus, unity, uh, to change the world in a positive way. That's That's been my purpose, okay? Um, along the way, I, uh, I, I received my master's degree at Columbia University. I studied John Milton two years under a br brilliant teacher. Uh, he was the... Uh, uh, Emeritus humanities teacher, Lionel Trilling, uh, emeritus teacher of the humanities. I was very fortunate to spend two years with him and I studied John Milton. So if you want to know when John Milton was born, when he died, that I can tell you. Okay. But I did study Paradise Lost and I studied what my thesis when on. Was um, when was it? Uh, with, this is back in the late 60s, is when I got my master's. No, right? you said. Along the way, along the way, I thought you were talking about five years ago. <laughs> no, along the way, it's it's been a long way. David will tell you. David and I go back to uh, uh, undergraduate humanities. <laughs> Dostoevsky. <laughs> right. Theodore. Uh, yeah, Theodore. Yeah. So um, I, I studied Milton very, and this has been a marvelous experience preparing. These 14 lines brought me back to my experience at Columbia and how much I got out of studying John Milton. John Milton, uh, a brilliant man. Uh, I have also another sheet. To, please, everybody, to, you're free to take one. This gives you a, a short synopsis of Milton's life. John Milton, he was born in uh, 1606, 1608, died in 1674. And he lived probably during one of the most... Uh, tumultuous um, eras of English history, because during Milton's uh, lifetime, there was a regicide. What does that mean? It means that they were so dissatisfied with their King Charles I that they basically executed him. He was executed by a group of people led by Oliver Cromwell. You may be familiar with his name. And uh, Milton was very much in favor of Puritanism. What does that mean? He was against the high church, the high church of bishops, 
bishops were taking in money and dispensing favors to their friends and giving them all kinds of uh, uh, passes with sinning. So Milton was against the high church. Milton was a Puritanist, meaning that he believed that your salvation is not predetermined like uh, many of the Christian groups believe that this Calvinism particularly believes in predetermination. It means that your life is determined from, from the day you're born till the day you're died, whether you're going to go to heaven and the Christians believe in hell. We don't believe in hell, uh, but we do in believe in some type of Gehenna. But Milton was a, a protester against Protestantism, and he was a Puritan, and uh, he lived a very amazing life as i could see and everybody should have a little synopsis um what i want to emphasize here he got the best education possible he went to saint paul's school it was a private school uh under saint paul's church uh, he learned a latin greek italian hebrew french and spanish so he can speak hebrew he could read hebrew um, he attended cambridge christ college he was called the lady of christ college because like um, Jacob, our forefather, he lived in the Ohel in the tent. He was he was a one who studied day and night, day and night, and so he was uh, it, he was hidden, if you will. He was making taken light of uh, in in this, and uh, and so he was given the epithet, the Lady of Christ College. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree there. Uh, he wrote early poetry starting at age 14. David Singer, it's always a pleasure to see you. Okay. Uh, wrote poetry starting at age 14. Um, he went into politics before he wrote his major works. Um, he, he left the, the world of uh, academia to become what's called the, uh, he was like a secretary of state. He was under the protectorate, which is Cromwell, his job was to write uh, letters to the various uh, state statesmen of Europe. So he wrote his uh, his letters in Latin, and he was basically a uh, someone like a Henry Kissinger type person. Uh, he 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 was in contact with it. He had a very high position, uh, and uh, what I want you to get out of this is that he was thrown in jail. Uh, for his, there was a restoration after uh, Cromwell's uh, uh, defeat, if you will, and they, they restored King Charles II. King Charles comes to, and Milton, of course, was an anti uh, regal. He was anti monarch. And so they put him in jail. He was in jail for a couple of years. Um, he was saved by his friend, Andrew Marvell. Andrew Marvell was a great poet. He was also a statesman, a great poet. He wrote, uh, you know, uh, some very light poetry, which we can talk about another time. But uh, Milton comes out, and when he comes out of jail, uh, he is he becomes blind at uh, in 1652. He's about 46. Um, uh, and uh, he becomes totally blind at this point. And uh, a lot of theories as to why he became blind, um, as you can read here. Well, I, well, I've written a lot of uh, uh, essays on Milton, which I can share with you guys if you want at a later time. But uh, he is told by his nephew, wrote a biography of him in the late 1600s. And he said that my uncle stayed up at night reading, reading, and that his father, who was a very wealthy scrivener and a real estate operator in London, pampered his son and he had a nursemaid that would go up and hold a candle to Milton so that Milton could read deeply into the night. So this is partially what I think may have caused his blindness. Um, or there are he other have been sick. Or he could may have been sick. He, he could have been sick. Yeah, I agree. He's in jail. He's in jail. He could have gotten sick from jail. Uh, but he was a, a voracious reader. That could be a lot of people say it's the way he treated his wives. He was married three times. Uh, his first wife, Mary Powell, left him at the end of three months. She just took off, went back to her daddy. And she didn't come back for about two or three years. Um, but she did come back. And he had he had three daughters and a son. His, his son 
three marriages. His son uh, was deceased. His daughters basically uh, took care of daddy. I mean, whatever he needed, he was blind and uh, they had to cater to daddy. Uh, so they say some of his blindness may be that he was a terrible father, a terrible uh, uh, husband. Uh, and but that's you know, that's his personal life. And um, I. I I, I came into the 17th century not really wanting to. You guys are wondering, what, what's uh, Richard Schwartz doing in the 17th century? I really didn't intend to become a Miltonist, so to speak. But because of the fact that Columbia had a lot of uh, of, of students from the, uh, the Army, uh, West Point, that were going into the modern, langu the modern languages and the modern uh, literature, that they all took the modern uh, spots that they had for uh, the master's program. So I was uh, uh, by default put into the 17th century, and it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Yes, <laughs> yes. It's winding up the 17th yes. century. If I had yeah. here modern, yeah. I immediately take another. So 19, I mean, there were, uh, besides Milton, you had John Donne, who was an incredible poet, and uh, At the Milton. At time, they yeah. lived. John Donne and John Milton knew each other. They wrote very, what are called metaphysical poetry, poetry that's very spiritual and very abstruse, meaning very difficult to understand. Uh, Milton is called the master of the grand style because Paradise Lost uh, is written in a very high style. Uh, and, and that's why people love Milton because no one could use that language the way that Milton used it. Uh, I recommend everybody, uh, there's a great article in the New Yorker it's called Return to Paradise. Uh, it's probably the last article written on Milton by uh, a fellow by the name of Jonathan Rosen. It's called Return to Paradise. And uh, he does a lot of quoting from Paradise Law. So, so you can get a feeling of what's called Milton's high style of writing. Um, I uh, One of my favorite uh, quotes from Milton, and I think this inspired me, he, he wrote in, in one of his essays, he says, I cannot praise a fugitive and cloistered virtue, unexercised and unabreathed, that never sallies out and sees her adversary, but slinks out of the race with the immortal garland is to be run for, not without dust and heat. That which purifies us is trial, and trial is by, is by what is contrary. What Milton is saying is that he has no respect for somebody who is, has great learning like he and doesn't get involved in the political foray. Somebody who has great learning, Kissinger, great, great scholar of, of Metternich and uh, Bismarck, uh, 19th century Prussian uh, culture and the, the way that Bismarck uh, united all these different confederacies in Germany to make a German nation. Um, uh, he was somebody who took his learning out into the realm, and Milton too. Milton took his learning. He was he wrote many essays. Uh, after his first divorce, uh, he wrote an essay on why divorce should be allowed in England because England was uh, under the rule of uh, Catholic uh, mores. The Pope uh, did not permit divorce, and Milton argued very strongly in favor of divorce. So. Um, I, I can't say enough about Milton, but I want to share with you guys that uh, this preparation, I spent hours looking at these essays I wrote on Milton and this teacher. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, he was, well, uh, you probably didn't hear this, but his father tutored him, gave him a great tutor, whatever he wanted. So he learned Latin, he learned uh, uh, Hebrew, he learned Spanish, he learned French. Um, he was so well tutored. And as a result, then he went to uh, Cambridge. He went to Christ College, Cambridge. And, and it was very important for people that were of his caliber of learning to, to write poetry, okay? And so he was constantly writing poetry, he wrote Lycidas, his early poetry, famous Comus, Lycidas, uh, uh, he went on Shakespeare, but his motivation was to show how much learning he had. His father pampered him with learning. And I must say that 
I forced my parents to pamper me because they didn't want to because they had to go into a profession. But I, I kicked out of, uh, of where I was supposed to be in medicine. I became a person that, uh, of learning and glad to share it. And that's who I am. But Milton was somebody who had to demonstrate his knowledge. And his knowledge was not limited to books. As he says, he cannot praise cloistered virtue, meaning that it's not good to accumulate all knowledge but not share it. So here's a man that had to share. He wrote Paradise Lost, and he wrote pa Paradise Lost is basically uh, the rebellion of Satan against uh, God. We don't believe that in our religion, but uh, uh, Milton did take a lot of Hebrew concepts uh, and, and, and brought them into his, uh, uh, his chapters in Paradise Lost. He wrote Paradise Regained to show how we regain the angels that were fallen uh, re uh, regained. And then he wrote Samson Agonistes, which is what I wrote my thesis on. Samson, as you know, is a blind judge. He's a blind judge who has his eyes gouged out. OK, and so uh, Samson Agonistes is in keeping with a lot of Western literature. Uh, we know Oedipus is one of the great works of Greek literature. Oedipus has his, his eyes um, gouged out after he uh, killed his mother and slept with his father. We know King Lear uh, had his eyes uh, uh, torn out because he, uh, he, he, his children, he demanded love for his children and they wouldn't give it to him. And uh, he, he, and, and, his children turned against him and they, they gouged out uh, his eyes in Gloucester. There were two people, I mean, it's a very sad play. Um, so Milton is in this tradition of, and of course, uh, we won't get there today, but I do promise that if you guys want, I will. Uh, in our tradition, we have um, Isaac uh, eyes becoming very, very dimmed. Um, uh, and then after Isaac's eyes being dimmed, uh, uh, we had Phyllis remind me that Leah's eyes became dim. Uh, Leah was uh, was uh, the word that they use is that she was um, had tender eyes. You know, there was there was Leah, and then there's Rachel. Rachel's beautiful. Leah's tender eyes. So that, and then we have Jacob. We're coming up to in the book of uh, of uh, Breshit. Uh, Jacob gives his blessings to his twelve children, and it says very specifically that his eyes are dimmed. Okay, and this is, I'm not making it up, but this, the metaphor of losing your eyesight is very much in keeping with Western literature. It's just a very much a part of it. And Milton sadly became a part of the literature. He, be, he became blind and he wrote his most brilliant works when he was blind, uh, an amazing man. He dictated, he has what's called an amanuensis, somebody who takes things, dress, a secretary, amanuensis from the word hand and someone who jotted it down. Um, so Milton is, uh, is great to study, but more so I wanna share uh, with you insights that, uh, that I have gathered. So problematically, we will not get to uh, a lot of Genesis. I know you guys want to, but I want to say that, that that's in in keeping with where we're going. But I do want to get back to the actual poem itself. Uh, it's written as a sonnet. You guys know a sonnet, 14 lines. Sonnet Shakespeare wrote many of them. And, uh, and this sonnet was written after he became blind, which is approximately 1650. Two is when he became blind, age 46. Um, and uh, he writes this uh, in order to show what I consider to be his, his philosophy, his theology, his philosophy. And, uh, and as, as I was reading it through this morning, I gained a lot of insights. And that's why I reason I did, uh, we have the, uh, the, um, the, the daily prayer books there, which I'm gonna ask Jonathan, hand out some because I'm going to um, make a reference to uh, some of the uh, liturgy that we have in our Sabbath prayer books. Okay, so um, it's called When I Consider How My Light Is Spent. Uh, what I'd like to do is just call on people, volunteers, to read a couple of lines. And uh, like we always do, you can comment on it. Anybody can pipe in and comment on it. And um, 
and and let's go from there and then i can bring in this this great insight that i had when i was reading it this morning i said wow okay all right um so uh lloyd you look like you're ready to read so why don't you read the first two lines yeah when i consider how my life is spent year half my days in this dark world and why okay all right so what's happening here okay what's happening okay he's already realized when he's going blind yeah uh yeah. He says that's half my life. That's the Yeah. That, uh, it's a very optimistic viewpoint for somebody going forward. That's how I take it. Very good. You pick up on something which I, I wrote in an essay. Uh, I just brought one of my essays that I wrote on this on this particular poem uh, about 12 years ago. And I'm, I will, I won't bore you with reading the whole thing, but uh, you, you pick up very well on that. He, he's looking at his his loss of sight as a as somewhat positive. I mean, what can I gain from this? What, you know, he's considering, he's not angry. He's not full of anger, which I will leave you with a bombshell at the end of the, of the session. Uh, as I perused uh, Genesis, I came up with these unbelievable bombshells that I discovered. I'm not the first one, but that Nachmanides also came up with it. But you asked me at the end of the session, what is that bombshell? Okay, so, he, he is very understanding and is sympathetic to himself. Look, uh, I'm blind. Uh, I've got half of my life yet to live. And no, notice what he says, in this dark world and wide. Um, he uses that word wide, which indicates that there's a lot of future for him. I mean, he hasn't written Paradise Lost yet. And yet he's, this world is dark. And it's why there's a tremendous opportunity for him to do whatever tikkun that he wants to do coming up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to call on Mike and Moshe to read the next two lines. Yeah. Uh, and that one talent, which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul more bent. Okay. Um, okay. One talent. That's a question I have. Any comment on that, Mike? Um, Death to hide, death to hide. Lodge with me useless. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I have I have the comments, but I don't want to bring too much in test minute. Yeah, is there anybody here that wants to come on? Uh, Lloyd, did you have, uh, you at one time told us that when you were taking uh, English uh, in the public school system, you, you had to memorize English and poetry, you had to you had to do rhetoric. My mom came from that same. She went to Seward Park High School and she was uh, he memorized poetry. Yeah, public school. But this was part of it that you just memorized it, and she could she could rattle off Shakespeare and Milton, and uh, because that was a part of the rhetoric. Yeah, Jonathan, what, uh, what do you come up with? One talent. Uh, is there anything that hits you with that? Well, I mean, I'm not. Um... Not school. I remember reading this, ago, but not schooled all that well in any of the Christian stuff. But of course, the you know, one of Jesus' parables. Talent, yeah, it's yeah. a parable. Yeah. 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 yeah, that that's one of the. Um, and, but I think that he's talking about here is his talent to be able to be creative. I mean, he's a like uh, Helene said. What, what was his drive to write so much? I mean, he had a talent. He had to. You know, he was a statesman for nine years. He had a very high position in government, and uh, uh, it was all lost when Cromwell was basically uh, exited, uh, and the they brought back the uh, the the king, King Charles II. So, uh, for in a sense, he's saying that I'm blind and I cannot do what I want to fully do, and that is express myself politically as well as uh, my talent for writing okay um, talent capitalized talent well that's what that's what uh, Jonathan was referring yeah. to that refers to the parable of the talents uh, in the New Testament mm -hmm. yeah um, okay um, Steve Schwartz yes, sir. okay all right why don't you continue with lodged with me useless uh, go ahead lodged with me useless though my soul more bent to serve there with my maker and sweet. okay now let's stop here okay 
Um, feedback, any feedback on this? Um, um, Looks like he's recognizing God. God. He's recognizing God, okay. Uh, how so? To serve my maker. Okay, and what about his soul? His soul okay. is it's like his soul is yearning for to to reach up to Hashem. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's more what, emotional. It's very it's very emotional. Lodge with me useless. It's you know my talent, my ability to communicate with people one on one to see people. I mean, Milton was somebody who was a politician along with Andrew Marvel, who got him out of jail. Another uh, poet. Um, Okay, and though my soul more bent there to serve there with my maker, okay, uh, he's got to do more to bring religion to where he feels it should be. And 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 again, I'm telling you that his his religion was one getting rid of these these intermediaries, the bishops and the episcopals, were in his humble opinion ruining the church. They were taking money. They were greedy. Uh, and along with one of the reasons that Charles was executed is because he was a dictator. He prevented free speech. They, 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 uh, many writers had their pamphlets confiscated, burned. I mean, this was, and there was a, a, a star chamber. Uh, some of you may have heard of that. That was a court that was under uh, King Charles in order to try people for treason against the, uh, against the commonwealth, okay. Um, okay, Gloria, would you like to continue uh, and present? My, my two accounts, my two accounts let he return inside, but God exacts day labor, life denied. Beautiful, it's one of my favorite lines of poetry. My mom would recite this. I couldn't believe it. She could just recite this. And she knew exactly what it said. Uh, I'm a freshman at Columbia and I knew nothing about poetry. And I brought her W. William, B William Butler Yeats poem, uh, The Last uh, Coming. And, and she sat down and she said, this is how you read poetry. You know, you, just, you, you have to read it and let your mind grasp it and think about what is he trying to say? Uh, and Milton couldn't have said it better here. Uh, that he sees God as his taskmaster, okay, if you will. And uh, if he doesn't exact day labor, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, what God has designated me to do, um, then I have failed my maker, you know, my account. And, uh, he says, yeah, God, God has an accounting, you know, here's, here's what you should do. And here are the points that add up to whether you should be getting up to that level. And God is like the one, like on uh, on our Yom Kippur, He adds up the pluses and the minuses and decides are you going are you going to live? And so this is the way Milton looks at God as somebody who who is a part of his life. And and <clears throat> Milton had a high talent with words and expression, and and he he's falling short of that light being able to express it. And that's what he's saying, that God exact, a, look, God, I'm I'm blind. What can I do now in order to serve you? And he's asking, what is my purpose? You know, he has not written Paradise Lost. He's written a lot of beautiful poetry and he's uh, corresponded with other nations. But now he's saying, look, there's a higher level. What is, what am I supposed to be doing, God? Explain to me, okay? And he finally, he finally asks, this is what, uh, uh, Lloyd picked up. He's he he's having a conversation with God. You know, Moses had these conversations with God, and Abraham had conversations with God. And this is uh, this is Milton's built, talking to God. I finally asked, "Talk to me, God." Okay, yeah. what am I supposed to do? And I think a lot of us have gotten to that point in life where we say, "You know, I'm not happy with what I'm doing. What should I be doing?" You know, you you have to demand an answer. When I left medical school to discover who I was, I I I was demanding. I mean, I told my parents, "This is not for me. I'm gonna I'm gonna find out what my real purpose is in life." And so that's what he's saying here. Give me an answer. And he says, and let's see how he continues here. Jake, you want to continue? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, looking for direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. He's looking for direction and he's demanding. I mean, that I, I went to a public relations counselor to demand, what am I supposed to be doing? He says, told me, this is my dad's friend. He says, you're supposed to be doing what I'm doing. Don't listen to your dad. Do what you're supposed to be doing. And uh, that was the best best uh, interview I've ever had when he told me, told my dad, this man is not supposed to follow you. He's He's got to do what he needs to do, okay? So you're right. I mean, he's he, he is demanding. He is really demanding. And that's what you have to do if you're going to find out what your ultimate purpose is, okay? And he fondly, he fondly asks. He's not, he doesn't want God to chime him. He doesn't want God to make, he says, look, I'm, I'm humble. He's a very humble man. Like Moses, very humble. Moses at the time was not humble, as we know, speaking to God. But here's, here's Moulton, very humble. Okay. Uh, Jake, you want to continue? Yeah. yeah. Finally asked for patience with the peaks of Lent that Merlin has seen replies. God does not need. Uh, okay, Can continue to the gift. Yeah. Continue. Mm -hmm. Either man's work on his own gifts. Who okay, cares? Okay. so let, let, let's stop here. Okay. But patience, okay. To prevent that murmur, okay. What 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 do we gather from that? What does it mean by patience? To prevent that murmur. Murmur is something very soft, very quiet. Yeah, patience here is his second thought. <laughs> right. He's going to he's going to ask if God exact day labor light denied, but he doesn't doesn't quite get to that point because patience comes along, his second thought comes along, prevents him from asking because he knows the answer. He knows that the answer that, you know, we don't do this stuff because God needs mm -hmm. us to move something from one point on the earth's crust to another. Very good. And furthermore, if, but going back to going back to the talents, what happened to the guy that got the servant that got only one talent and he buried it? The master comes back and throws him out. He hid the talent. He's obviously mm -hmm. not what, what you're supposed to do is what you have, which means you have to figure out from what you have how that would be useful, right? Day labor, if you can't see, is not clearly what's going to be asked of you. You have to figure out what that is. You know, and, the, and when the answer comes, when we get to the end, we'll talk about what the... Yeah, day the labor, uh, you know, we think of a, a laborer, somebody who's you know, his hand, manual labor. Yeah. Yeah. Day labor, right, something yeah. that you need to be able to see to do. Because you can't, can't do it at night, you have to be able to see to do it, and if you're blind, you're not going to be asked to do that. There's going to be some other task for you. You have okay. to see what that's going to be. That's, very good. That's Any comments on that? Right. Yeah. Comments? Alvin, you're sitting very quietly there. Wouldn't you help us out with uh, uh, God doth not need? Alvin, are you there? Al, Al, you're coming. Al, go Al. I thought that's Al, Al, Alvin. I got, my dad's middle name was Alvin. Excuse me. <laughs> it's Alvin. Uh, tell, tell me the way it is. Come on. Or Al or Pam, one of you. Okay. This reminds me of uh, the uh, one of the prophets that God is saying that I don't need to sacrifice it. I need you to do, you know, mm -hmm. all the mixed those, but I, I, I mean, God doesn't need anything. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to read it? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That yeah, yeah, replies. read it. Yeah. Memory yeah. yeah. soon replies, God does not need either his work or his own gift. He best bears his mild yoke. They serve him best. Okay. That does remind me of that uh, in the prophets. Uh, that's what I would use sacrifice. Same kind of idea. Any thoughts about his use of the language here? Uh, he, in a sense, he's saying he doesn't need your own gifts. Does he really mean that, Jonathan? I know you. I know you. You're you're playing with these ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, God does not need either man's work or his own gifts. Uh, what does he mean by gifts? I mean, that, that's a question here. Who best bear his yoke, they serve him best. Okay. Um, it seems to me that what he's saying here, I keep thinking of the, the, the expression, Amal Torah, that when you 
study something, especially Torah, Talmud, you are laboring. Amal means serious work. Okay, get through it. Um, and, and mild yoke. He feels that he has to do something at this point in his life. I think he had Paradise Lost in back of his mind. He hasn't, he's certainly not written it out so that we know he, at this point, 16, 52, 53, 54, that he has written it. But he feels that there is a mild yoke. Okay. He's got to do something in his life. Um, and what he's saying is look, uh, there are periods of times, and I wrote about this in my essay here, which, which really brought me back to uh, reality, is that. There are certain times of your life that you are, you're given a pass. There are certain times that you need to just step back from what you're doing and just gather your senses and take a trip. I wrote here, uh, sometimes after a major struggle to see the light, to extract meaning of our daily endeavors, we might just as well take five, take time out to cultivate the relationship with the Supreme Creator and above all, our loved ones. Perhaps it's time to take a weekend retreat, a month vacation from the rat race, or even a sabbatical year to smell the roses and reconnect with self. How often have we heard, find your burning desire, your major purpose in life, and pursue it, okay? Uh, I, and I continue, Milton is way ahead of his time. Uh, so I, uh, Milton is, he's biding his time here. You know, he knows that he's got this great work in, in his mind that he's going to create. And he's taking a breather of some sort. He's got this mild yoke pulling on him. I've got to write my opus magnus, my paradise lost. Uh, and I will serve you. That sometimes just by kicking back and to the world, you're doing nothing. But you are actually, you know, you're moving forward. You're, you're hibernating, but you're thinking. You're taking a trip. I meet people uh, along the way that tell me that they've they know what career to pursue. They're, they have drop one career and what to do. I said, well, take time out. Take a trip. Take a trip. Go, um, uh, go somewhere. Get out of Stanford, whatever. But find out, you know, give yourself some breathing time because our society, you know, it's work, work, work. We live in a city that works. Stanford is a city that works. And do we ever work in order to pay our mortgages and take care of each other and so forth so i think milton has got a really positive attitude here about serving him best bear you know bear it whatever it is i mean abraham had 10 uh 10 different uh, trials and abraham bore it he bore through every single one and uh he established the last time we did the covenant of the pieces so uh he he passed that along to his children and i and i do have a little ideas on isaac uh, which we can do next time if you guys want to do it isaac picked up the mantle from his father uh his father did a lot but isaac is somewhat of a uh, a passive individual he's passive I mean, there's a whole chapter on him finding a wife uh, but he's not finding a wife it's somebody else finding a wife for him okay there's a chapter when he's ordered by god to take his child up to have the akeda to have the binding uh, but this is God's will. He follows God's will. I mean, he's just seems to be. And then suddenly, as I read through uh, uh, Genesis, uh, God blesses him with a hundredfold. It says a hundredfold, right? And they are. Uh, man knows his Torah. I know. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, he said, God all of a sudden blessed him with a hundredfold, where, whereas one farmer would get one measure, he got a hundred measures. And he didn't know what to do with this. Here's a man tremendous. He's having a fight with uh, Avimelech over wells and this and that. And finally, he, he finds his own his own wells uh, far away from him. But um, uh, it's finding your way. You know, uh, uh, Abraham was a great man. So so Isaac was in his own way. But no, you know, you can't follow this expression in in our Hebrew literature. Maaseh avot uh, Simon. Banim, okay. Man le banim. Simon le banim, okay. That what the the example that the father set is what the children will follow, okay. And if the father sets a positive example, Abraham, incredible example. And so Isaac, well, Isaac is an intermediary intermediary between him and Jacob. And of course, we do, you know we learn that Jacob's eyes become dim later on. Uh, so we have a lot of dimming here. And Milton is very positive. Yes. They were all good motivated, but it's up to the individual to cope 
but they, they were really motivated. This is a poem in, in motivation. You have to find out if you're going to really find happiness in life, you have to really pursue Amal. You got to really be a put the yoke on your neck and pull hard. I mean, you got to discover what it is you're good at and just really pursue it. Uh, and that's what Milton did. Milton, yeah, you know, want to look at divine providence. God gave him. Uh, the ability to write a fantastic poem, which I'd like to share with you guys. Uh, I'll, I'll post uh, uh, in what I call uh, the... Um, Basically, it was different. He had had a life, and it was a way of going, and all of a sudden, it stops. It stops completely because he can't handle anything at that point. And he really has to look, first of all, to accept the challenge, and secondly how to handle it from there with a certain desire and a, and a wish from God to give him the strength to go ahead. We don't realize, uh, Anne, what you're saying is that what a shock it must have come to John Milton, who saw life in its fullest and wrote fantastic early poems, Lycidas, one of the great poems of the English language, uh, to suddenly have the light removed and what he's questioning is, why did this happen to me? Why me? Uh, and to be able to pull, you know, I say, took time off. You know, he's saying, look, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm mildly asking. The yoke is there. It's a mild yoke, but uh, I'm bearing my mild yoke and I'm ready to serve you, God. And uh, notice what he says here. Uh, and I think this is beautiful. I had beautiful insight this morning. Uh, and do I have a volunteer? Dave, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Dave, why don't you read? But I, I, I don't. I'm from Columbia. We maintain you, relationship going back many can years. You, can you pass on me because I don't have it in front of me? Okay, let me just. And, and uh, so. Uh, I am terribly. for me? I apologize. No, 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 that's all right. Why don't someone else read for me? So, because okay. it's getting late. Okay, Dave. Here it is. Uh, let me just see here. Go, go right ahead. Okay. Um, do we have a volunteer? What's the first word I should start with? Okay. okay. So you, his state, his state is okay, kingly. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidding speed and post over land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. His state is kingly. What does that make you feel? <laughs> Wouldn't we all like to be at that kingly state, right? To feel you're up there with God. But uh, Milton, in a humble way, is saying, look, I'm up there. I've got talent, unused talent, and I'm not using it at this point. And I'm kicking, I'm kicking tires, as, as we say. He's not, uh, he's not bitter. He says, I fondly ask. He doesn't well, foolishly, foolishly in the yeah, it, 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 does, it does have that meaning. Yeah, it does have. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we, today we would say foolish. Oh. Yeah, it does have that meaning. Yeah. yeah. But he's saying yeah. 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 17th century stuff going, uh, 17th century stuff going on here. Oh. And in fact, one of the keys when you, when you get to the end, he answers his question, what he's supposed to do at the end with a reference to Psalm 27. And this is tricky for Jews because when we read Psalm 27, which we do every day yeah. in uh, Elul and Tishrei, we, uh, we say, Kaveh al Hashem. We always translate, look in the book there, I'm sure you'll find, yeah. translated literally as, as um, hope, mm -hmm. because that's what it means, right? But Milton, especially when he's a little kid and doing, didn't know any Hebrew yet, when he first read 27th Psalm, yeah. uh, what, how did how does you know, King you know King James was hot off the presses then that was that was the Bible you had to have in England right if you were an English speaker and the way the Psalm ends in the King James version is wait not hope translates Kaveh as wait there's some Christian theology a sort of reinterpretation of yeah we know what David really meant and so you have and this it's fleshed out in Paradise Lost you have these two categories of of angels, the angels of action. God has all these resources that will post on land and ocean without rest. Thousands of them. Doesn't need, what does he need for Milton? They're also the angels of contemplation. 
if, if, if Milton's going to emulate any angels, it's going to be these angels of contemplation. Mm -hmm. As a scholarly poet, scholarly essayist, political essayist, he's going to be one of those who wait, but wait in the Psalm 27 sense, not the, the way we've necessarily used the word in the 20th century. So that's what's going on here. He's, he's recognizing God is a king. God, uh, when it comes to moving things from one place to another, he's got plenty of resources to do that. But it's those other angels that he uh, mentions in Paradise Lost who are just contemplating, seeing what you know, what is going to have to be done next. What, what is the, the next thing that needs to be uh, needs to be thought out and planned? And Milton is going to emulate. He's going to become one of those. Jonathan, I want to add to what you're saying here. Uh, thousands at his bidding speed. If you turn to page 404 in the um, in the prayer book, uh, I, I flashed on this this morning and it really rang true. And then I heard uh, uh, I heard a beautiful singer uh, do this, uh, sing this melody. Okay, so we're talking about thousands at God's bidding speed and post over land and ocean. And, and, and I thought about this makalot revu. This is page 404. It's the prayer. Uh, it's a prayer, a second prayer in bold print in the Hebrew side and on the left side for those who are reading English and in the assemblies of the myriads. Makalot means congregations, okay? Revavot means Thousands and thousands. Revised ten thousand. Ten thousand. Okay. Amcha uh, Beit Israel of your people of Israel uh, come with happiness and praise uh, to you, our King, from generation to de generation. Okay. Um, for it is the duty of all creatures before you, Hashem, our God. God of our Father, to thank, laud, praise, glorify, exalt, adore, bless, raise high, and sing praises, even beyond all expressions of the songs and praises of David, the son of Jesse, your servant, your anointed. Uh, this, I just happened to uh, uh, Google it on, in Hebrew and my, uh, my, my little PDA here, and I had Mordechai ben David sing a beautiful uh, melody of this is just gorgeous, but it's just the idea of that. God, you have your angels. You have, we are your angels and we are attuned to you and that we are patiently waiting for our time in life to serve you with honor, dignity, respect. We come running after you. Um, and I think this is, this was hinted to me from, uh, from uh, Milton's uh, liturgy, I thought about this. Um, anybody have any comments that you want to expand on this? Um, I like that he posed over land and you have this tremendous uh, horde of, of angels coming to worship God um, uh, willingly because they have no, actually they have no will. Angels do not have any will. They have to follow God. So um, he is saying here, basically, this is his wish, if you will, that people will not only patiently wait for God's word to come to them, you know, and what am I supposed to do, but that they will draw others to follow them. And that, you know, will be a nation, like it says in the Olena, will be a nation, one one globe on one nation under God that every different religion will come together and worship God uh, uh, forever from generation to generation. Um, any comments? Any comments? Um, yeah. I think it's an important word because I think that's what he is going to have to do to be able to wait to find out what it's going to be and how what he is going to be doing and that's where the word patience comes in it's a beautiful poem of the patience uh it's a beautiful poem he's a i write he's a way ahead of his time he could not bear being idle and he had to have a constant mission to perform to serve his fellow englishmen by writing profound literature he also had to serve the republic as a as a public servant 
Sonnet 19 was once high school required reading material in New York City required. And indeed, this poem is one of my mom's favorite. She'd love to quote it. Milton became blind in 1655, wrote this poem to express his reverence for the supreme being who has given the gifted poet a test, just another test, in order to learn patience to serve his master as best as he could. Um, it's a great poem. Um, yes. I believe there was a guy who had everything and lost everything and then through his own perseverance regained it. Joe. I don't that's remember. Joe, right? What? What? Joe. 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 Oh, Joe. Mm -hmm. well, that's what I remember. And Not necessarily it his perseverance, mm -hmm. but he and, did regain it. And maybe that Milton extracted that thought from the Bible. And, and presents it here in his own archaic way. Archaic to us. <laughs> uh, I can't think of any of our forefathers, I'm thinking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, that contributed so much. I mean, the, the, I wanted to make a transition to uh, the loss of eyesight of Isaac, Isaac's sight became dimmed. Okay, now as a as a segue, uh, why did his eyesight become dimmed? Somebody other than I uh, saw Jonathan has some great ideas. I know, but uh, before, before I call on Jonathan, no, uh, I'm not sure I want to go there. So. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, there's a lot of midrash on uh, on Isaac, uh, why his eyesight, and I'll pull it up here. Um, why did Isaac become blind? Um, anybody? He got old. Oh, okay, he came, he lived and, right, that's, okay. He became old. Okay, well, perfect. He's supposed, yeah. right. he's supposed to be what? A student. Um, Do a lot of reading. Well, reading. you know, we don't. See, his life is really sandwiched between two great forefathers. Yes. He's, yes. he's the middle guy. And you know, I, w I was the middle son uh, surrounded by two brilliant brothers. Uh, and, you know, and uh, what? He, exactly. I mean, he had a great, and God tells him, I'm making your people because of the your great deeds that your father did. He, God reminds Isaac of that. Yeah. I think. Maybe a manifestation of um, the sorrow that he had in his life. Remember, he lost his favorite son, disappeared. And okay, and we're talking about Isaac now? Okay, he lost his favorite. No, you're talking about his favorite wife. Jacob. Oh, right? Jacob. Jacob, yeah. Yeah, no, no, Isaac. Uh, uh, I, I would like to suggest yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, it's about determinism. Determinism, okay. Mm -hmm. Determinism. Yeah. I'll try to say it. I don't know if I can phrase it correctly. Uh, this was a way, well, when Isaac gave his blessing, he was supposed to bless not Jacob by Esau. Mm -hmm. And uh, if his eyesight was right, he would do that. Okay, he would bless That's perhaps the perfect wrong, answer that's an answer that i would wrong get. beautiful yeah. person yeah so that's but the second actually, by god blinding him he, he was in a yeah. position that he didn't see with his eyes but he saw with his soul and with his soul he blessed someone that he suspected it's not he said he was touching yeah, yeah. his arm and he yeah. said this and the is, voice, the voice, the, the 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 arm is is uh, is Esau, you know that he was hairy, but the voice is the voice of Jacob. Jacob. So he had some doubts, he had some suspicion. In still, he went forward with this. Um, I would say with this uh, kind of uh, doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay, he pretended some. Midrashim say that he knew and he pretended 
to do what uh, what his wife Rebecca and uh, and God commanded him to do. Uh, so he gave uh, Jacob the blessing and all the rest it's history. Rebecca, it's interesting. Rebecca, I looked up the root word of Rebecca. Rebecca means to see. <clears throat> uh to connect okay but it also that means to snare so she was a snare in her own way like eve was a snare with adam uh and then it, just before uh, this particular segment about his eyes becoming dim uh he tricks avimelech he tells he tells avimelech the king and this is a repetition what abraham went through yes. he said this is my sister and then all of a sudden there's a phrase in there that says and Avimel looked down, and he, there is Isaac playing, fondling, uh, making, uh, you know, making uh, lovey dovey with his wife, you know. And and Avimel felt tricked. Okay, so uh, there is an element of uh, of lightness there. Uh, what I want to say is that just before the sentence which says that his Isaac's light became dim, you have his brother Esau marrying two wives. Okay, yes. now. Uh, the rabbis make a lot of that because they say because the wives were there and they were they were they had their altars were to uh, many gods that all this smoke from the uh, the uh, the altars affected his brother's eyes. So that's 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 the, the wives third one. were not Jewish. They were not. They were they were Genesis. they were heathen wives. They were heathen wives. Yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah, they were heathen wives. Yeah. The fourth, the fourth one is something that uh, is not so obvious. The rabbis say that when Isaac was on brought to the top of Mount Moriah for the Akeda for the binding and the mm -hmm. killing, when he saw that knife coming down on him, it blinded him. That's what they say. That it was so frightening to him that he it, it, it took away his he couldn't he couldn't face it. Yeah, mm -hmm. couldn't face it. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. I just want to ask a question. Sure. And maybe make a comment. Sure. You know. Perhaps the ideology of the blessing given to Jacob was that uh, uh, he married out of the faith uh, he saw, and that was uh, not something that was good for uh, Rebecca and uh, and Isaac uh, and for the Jewish people, and that was the ed the ideology of uh, giving the blessing to Jacob. I think. But I just want to mention something because when I got this uh, note from you about the connection with Isaac, uh, I think Milton, uh, like Isaac, or Isaac was very passive, as you said. He's very what? Passive. Passion. Passion. Okay. Yes. And 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 Milton became passive. Passive. Okay. Passive. After this situation, so. It was only the passive Isaac who felt the distress of his wife and cared about her feelings. Uh, that is important for us to see. And the best thing to do, we, we can do is to be passive and listen to what other people say and listen to what God is saying. And when they've told us what they want, what God wants, which is what Milton was, I think, asking, and not what we think they want. <laughs> Very difficult to do. I, I agree 100% that. And then, then you can act. In other words, God, I've always wondered, you know, we can ask God for uh, forgiveness. We can ask God we're in trouble. But I always ask myself, well, why do I have to praise God? Why, why does God need praise? And he's saying, Milton, God doesn't need praise. <laughs> you know, that answers my question of, we, he doesn't need praise. Uh, and his yoke is mild. So he's pulling me along, but he's not choking me to death. <laughs> You know, he's, he's bringing it along. So I think the idea of being passive, even when you're meeting people, you know, if you're extending this whole thing, you know, draw out what they have to say and what they're thinking before you're aggressive and you jump in. You know, Abraham didn't, was not as sympathetic to his wife 
he didn't pray to God, you know, uh, you know that that his wife couldn't bear a child. Uh, Jacob, Jacob said to his wife, you know, well, who do you think I am, God? You know, I know you're barren, but I, what do you want from me? But Isaac didn't do that. So we have a different cat and a different approach on a human level uh, as well as uh, toward God. So that that's just... Uh, Thank uh, you for your insight. I, I, I agree to a extent that what, what is the important message is for yourself. We, we, we don't pray to God that God doesn't need our praise. Totally agree. All these prayers that the rabbis have created, no, that's for you to discover who you are. You stand in front of, of an unknown presence, and you're basically saying, hey, you're not pulling on me like Milton, but you know what am I supposed to be doing? I mean, I you created me for a purpose. I feel I've got a lot of talent. So show me in your mild way. Other people will point out to you. You're not supposed to be doing what you're doing, Dave. You got to be doing something else. You're wasting, right. spinning your wheels. So that's a great takeaway. Now, I did say it's one o'clock. I did say I would throw a little bombshell out here for us to think about. And here's my little bombshell pro uh, problematic. It's in Genesis 15, 5. And Sarah, I agree with you, is an unknown equation. She's very problematic. And Nachmanides said, because of Sarah's attitude, we were thrown 430 years into servitude. Now, where does he get that? And I suspect he may have read this very carefully. Sarah is now talking to Abraham, and she's saying, she tells Abraham, Hamasi Alecha, my anger, my revenge is against you because you have put me in the arms of this shifcha of yours, of this, of this maidservant. You have not prayed for me. He is, he, Abraham is, Sarah is saying, look, when you had your covenant of the peace with God, which we had last time, you didn't include me. That was your offspring. You could have another woman and have children with her. But where am I in the equation? So here Sarah is expressing her Hamas, her bitterness, her anger to throw her maidservant into the wilderness and get rid of that, that Ishmael. And I think that's something that we need to think about, the Hamas that Sarah has brought into the life of the patriarchs. And, and it, in a way, you know, I, I, I have these quotes, frailty, thy name is woman, says Hamlet and Shakespeare, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Uh, these, are, these are problematic uh, questions that it's not, but Nachmanides picked up on it, and Nachmanides said this is the reason that she had so much bitterness in her that we were doomed to be in slavery for 430 years. I'm just mentioning it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> and with that, I pause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank all of you. For, I enjoyed the participation. And, and Dave, you could hear better. I had the, the I had the microphone right in the center, so I'm sure you could pick up better. A little bit, yeah. Not a little enough, better, a little yeah. Better, but... Feel free to keep whatever you want, yeah. Uh, <laughs> good season okay. to everyone and a good all right video. hey look we have enjoyed it it's very uh david it uh, brought back such great memories from columbia <laughs> yes and, uh, and to barry and uh ted taylor you know the oh yeah two years it was a great Giants. experience Giants. going through i've written seven essays on milton and taylor and Thanks for sharing it with me and, yeah. and everyone else. And hey, everyone. look, I'm I'm happy to share it. I mean, <laughs> that's the reason I'm here. Yeah, you know? I mean, I I I borne my yoke very mildly, Dave. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> Love you. One of these times we we need to get together. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Take care. Thank you, thank you for staying with us. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Th thanks, Jim. I've learned a lot. Thank no, you. Thank you. Yeah. Our things are going to be stopped. Uh, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. Hey, look, a lot here. I'm just, I'm just sharing what, you know, what, I, what other people have shared with me. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I, I, and all the good food I'm able to share.
613. Yay, 613. <laughs> yeah. Yay for 613. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. That must mean something different from Dave. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. Come again. We'll 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 be doing it once a month next year, once a month. Yeah. Once a month. Okay. Have a good week, guys. Take care. So he sort of with that. So was he Okay. Well, no, he was Latin and Greek sources as well.